Birds of Pink. Welcome everybody to our 4 p.m. Pacific time session, uh, Make Humanized Your Modality. Um, before we begin, I just have a couple brief um, logistics to run through with you all. This session is being recorded for our colleagues who couldn't join us in real time, whether they uh, have a work uh, endeavor or just at a time that's not convenient. Um, we are using the auto captions in Zoom. So if you would like to use those, go ahead and use the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom window and then select uh, show subtitle or live transcript. And then you can turn those on and off as you wish. Um, we encourage active participation in all of these sessions. So please post comments and questions in the chat. And then later on toward the end of the hour, we'll share how we can continue the conversation asynchronously. For those of you who are watching the recording, for example, um, there's a Padlet board where you can share your comments and questions there as well. So now uh, I'd love to um, introduce the speakers today. Um, Brett Christie from O'Donnell Learn and Jerry Hanley from California State University, Long Beach. Um, I'll let you both give your um, bona fides and credentials to, uh, to the crowd here, but um, please take it away. All right, Jerry, you want to take it for a moment? It's kind of Sure, well, welcome everyone. And just, we are so grateful for uh, Kevin and his team and at the uh, Peralta Equity Conference to create a community of people sharing just so uh, amazing efforts and, and ideas and research. So we're, we're just happy, very much happy to be part of this. And, and I think um, I'll, I'll just start off with, with one of my uh, sayings that, that I think hopefully will um, permeate throughout this uh, session today is when we think about education, our job is to teach people and not information. And that means how do we understand the human beings that are in our classes that, that will be learning the process and not just the information that I as the faculty member have to say and, and really beginning with right from the get-go when we meet our students and how some of the tools that we use to educate such as the syllabus really can be one of those first steps in building those humanized relationships in the way you are delivering that course material. Yeah, uh, great. Thanks, Jerry. And, and just, um, you know, for myself, what this title and what this session means to me is, you know, uh, humanizing has been something I've been doing for a long time in different areas of what I've been doing with um, course redesign and, and different efforts in factor development. And, you know, going into this year and what we've been through the last couple of years, and you see, I've seen renewed debate around this modality and that modality, and still people who question online as being effective and saying it just can't be any good and this is better when we know that it can be good in either way or it can be bad in either way, depending on how it's designed, how it's delivered and the faculty member. And so I just decided my, my goal for 2022 was to really lean into make humanized your modality because no matter what modality you choose for delivery, facilitation and all of that, it's really got to be humanized to be effective. And as Jerry said, it's got to be about people, not content or information. So that was just really my way of jumping head on into this this year and, and kind of making that my theme, I would say. Um, just as far as our backgrounds, I'll do an introduction and then Jerry, I'll pass it back to you for a moment. Um, so Brett Christie, and I'm currently VP for Learning Design and Inclusivity at O'Donnell Learn, which is a learning design company that's been around for about 30 years. Um, I've been in this role for the last two years. I retired out of the CSU uh, after about 25 years in higher education. Uh, so I've worked all across the CSU system, also with the California Community Colleges and the UCs as well. And uh, just fun fact, this being heavily community college based, um, I am a AA degree graduate from Diablo Valley College back in the 80s, wow. <laughs> so I was thinking about that earlier today. I thought, oh my gosh, yeah. And I actually had occasion to go there recently. I'm, I'm based in Olympia, Washington, but I was actually on the Diablo Valley campus about a month ago. And uh, so it was just fun to go back and see the old turf. So Jerry, I'll turn it over to you for a moment and then we'll take off. 
Okay, Th thank you, um, Brett. Uh, my name's Jerry Hanley. Um, I'm a uh, recovering administrator from the California State University system. Um, for almost 20 years, I was the assistant vice chancellor for academic technology. Um, and uh, before that, uh, my road to ruin, I was uh, at Cal State Long Beach as a professor of psychology. And uh, since I uh, retired from my administrative position, I'm back as faculty at Cal State Long Beach owing that end. And uh, going back years, I I'd have to say, um, I first started teaching as a graduate student in 1978. Um, and so uh, when I start thinking about that, that's a long time. And, mm -hmm. and I have to say, um, the humanizing aspect of um, the educational experience, unfortunately, has just been more of a recent effort when, when we're thinking about institutionally. You may try to do it personally, but how do we really enable it institutionally, I think, has been such an important element that's emerging in higher education. So um, with that, Brett, I'll pass it back to you for um, kind of the next slides there that we have. Get us going, you bet. So, and folks, please do uh, comment or question in the chat and we'll be sure to keep track of that between Jerry and myself. And I know Kevin will assist as needed. And then we'll try and have some dialogue at the end as well. All right, so, and we'll have contact information for you at the end. So we want to talk about humanized learning. Some of you may have attended Michelle Pekansky Brock's session at noon today. Great information there. I love what she's doing with her current research and factor development and really targeting STEM and, and trying to close equity gaps. Um, we're going to be in the same realm, but approaching it differently and talking about um, some different examples along the way in a different, in a different way, but certainly in parallel to what you experienced there. So it's not going to be a repeat whatsoever, but very much similar in the dedication. Uh, we'll talk about our purposeful learning, learning framework and how we use that as our construct and how we dive into certain areas uniquely compared to other frameworks and things like that. And then we've got a number of resources that you're free to adapt or adopt from our session today. And so I know Kevin's already got the link to the slides and things are embedded throughout that you can access if you choose to or, um, after the session. <clears throat> so. This is our purposeful learning framework that we use. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with Quality Matters. And I know there's also your framework within the California Community College system. Um, this comes from a little bit of Quality Matters background, but also in the CSU system and in working for Jerry, I led the CSU Quality Learning and Teaching Program. We developed a, an instrument, if you will, and we developed training around that and reviewed courses and pro did professional development. Um, in my role in the last couple of years, I brought a lot of that experience with me and we turned it into this purposeful learning framework. And what's different about this is you'll see things on the left-hand side that are more about the functional components. I mean, we do it a little bit differently on the left-hand side, but I think everybody can relate to those functional components that are there. But I think where we do things differently is we really stand out on the right-hand side where we focus on the student-centric aspects and there's a lot of equity and access and humanizing and in community and all of those things over there that really make a difference and really make it about the students, not the information or the content. So that's where we'll spend more time today. But that framework is also available to you if you're interested. And it has these eight elements and I think 34 objectives behind those that are meant to be guideposts. It's not meant to be evaluative. It's not like a Quality Matters program. It's really a, a series of guideposts for you for iteration. And we have resources tagged to those elements as well. So in thinking about humanizing why it's so critical these days, I mean, think about what your students or your guests are like as they're showing up to your classroom. Um, I like this research that came out about a year ago, so pretty much mid-pandemic. I don't like the results, but I, I, I like the fact that there's the focus here and we're really starting to lean into, okay, students need a lot of support. And I think even us as individuals can relate to a lot of these things, think more anxiety, more depression, more burnout these days. So you can look at the difference just between, uh, you know, early pandemic to mid pandemic and how that's changed in the significant increase on the right hand side there. And then if we look at some of the behavioral factors, so um, unhealthy eating, alcohol to cope, tobacco or vaping, uh, physical activity actually going down. Uh, the last one, mental health counsel has gone up significantly. Now that's 
you can say that's a bad thing, absolutely, because of the behavioral aspects and the conditional aspects. But I think everybody can feel like, okay, more mental health counsel is a good thing for everyone. It's something we can all benefit from. So yes, that's a negative thing, but more and more people hopefully are availing themselves of that support. So this is just kind of thinking that as students are coming into your environment, these are some of the factors they're facing. So how can you create that new sense of arrival? So we really talk about the welcome, that sense of welcome and belonging. Um, so this is sort of your welcome mat. How do you welcome students into your course, into that experience? And so we begin with talking about humanizing the syllabus. And I know some people have been doing this for a while. It's starting to catch momentum, but I still see predominantly the same text-based syllabus that is in third-person language that's almost catalog copy or department copy type stuff. But we still work with faculty to try and really humanize their syllabus so that students will take notice. Uh, why do we tend to still see the same patterns? How, how did you, some of you learn to create a syllabus? Uh, go ahead and share in the chat if you would briefly. Think back to creating your first syllabus for those of you, for those of you that are instructors primarily. If you're in more of a, an instructional support role, you can think about how the faculty you work with might do that. But how do people learn to create a syllabus? And it's not something to take for granted. It's a significant element of that course and getting things off to a good start. So faculty mentors, yeah, Sally. So it could be that you, maybe you were new coming into the position or first time teaching that course. So you have a mentor you have with them or it's somebody who's taught that course repeatedly, then you might ask them to share their syllabus with you and to, and to talk it over with you. I know for me, it was pre-internet. I would go to the department AC and ask if I could dig through the files of the department and then get permission of that instructor or those instructors to be able to pull elements of their syllabus. And Started with colleagues. Yeah, Jerry. And, and Brett, I think one of the aspects about the syllabus, mm -hmm. we often think of that as being real, the uh, an agent of the institution and mm -hmm. that how that's its focus. And so, oh, I would go to the curriculum committee's approval of the syllabi for that course that was required for approval. And, and I think one of the things we're gonna emphasize is, is to humanize means to shift the locus of its purpose from administration to student. And, and that's something uh, I think that that's gonna be important. When, when I think about how I learned, it was, uh, you know, as a new faculty, you know, I came in as a scholar and now suddenly I have to learn how to teach what the rules, what's the rules of the institution. And I think that's often how that brings um, that, that context of an institutional focus often has permeated the, the, third, the third party voice uh, of the institution in the syllabus. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Yeah, and I think what we're hearing from everybody is we all kind of looked at what others before us have done, and, and that's great. It's helpful to do that and to learn from that. But in doing so, we've tended to mimic what's been done before, and we're kind of perpetuating the same patterns, which aren't necessarily the best thing to do in this case, in the case of the syllabus. Um, so let's let's talk then from that into going a different direction. So we like to talk about trying to humanize early and often. And so this is something that you can do even before students come to you the first day of class. How can you do that from the time of registration or when they're even shopping for courses to take? How can you as an instructor have your syllabus listed online? How can you create a humanized syllabus that communicates them to them right away? Or as they come toward the beginning of the course, how in that week prior can you really have some good welcoming types of content for students, that it's student-centric, that it gives a sense of belonging, that all students are welcoming, will contribute, it's inclusive. So really welcoming, supporting, and connecting with them as early as you can, and hopefully as often possible going forward. And we'll talk about some of those techniques. Oops, sorry, if I use my mouse, I, I find that it jumps around too much. Um, so your thoughts about creating a humanized syllabus, you know, I think for time purposes, feel free to put anything to, to the chat at this moment. We're, we're going to actually get into a Padlet in a moment. So we're going to keep this going forward a little bit. Um, how many of you focus on the tone of your syllabus? If you want to just say anything in the chat, feel free. But this is research that just came out in the last year. And again, the link to the article itself 
is here in the slide deck you can access afterwards if you want to. I didn't want to make it really heavily laden with reference material. Um, but the importance of syllabus tone and how the research has actually shown this, and this comes out of Oregon State University, and where they found that the warmer tone syllabus for the course, that students in that course are actually significantly more likely to ask for help. And they found this in particular for underrepresented minority students that they were more likely to help. So that warm versus cold. And it doesn't mean that you're going to just make things easier for them. You're not gonna lose rigor, so to speak, which is another trigger word, um, but you're gonna be able to get them to feel more invited and more um, welcome to ask for help outside of class. And so just to give you an example here, and this is a handout that we have available for you linked on this slide, where we've taken some examples and compared and contrasted. And if you look at the left-hand side, you can look at a more welcoming example. Maybe we'll focus on the second one versus the unwelcoming. And it's not that the one on the right is bad or pejorative necessarily, but the one on the left is better in language and that it's more first person, it's more supportive, and it's more process oriented. Uh, it's more class as community oriented. So I'll just let you uh, compare and contrast a little bit, maybe on that bottom row. And then again, feel free to access that resource and use as you will going forward, um, either for your own purposes or feel free to share it with others. Again, these are Creative Commons licensed resources that we have for you. So adapt or adopt, whatever you wanna do, just share alike. And, and Brett, just a, you know, a reminder that you know, recognizing that the educational process requires the students to feel that they belong in the class, that, that they have an important role to play in their own learning. And, and when you have a welcoming process with them, when you feel that you're talking to them, you're inviting them to be active members within, within the community of the class and engage in their learning. The third I'll say that you know the third voice of uh, of a, a distancing and just describing what you are requiring for the for the course seems to say, well, then what's my role as a student, right? And am I just supposed to be here compliant and quiet and take whatever it is? So I think just initially establishing with that voice is so important in recognizing the importance of a student centered educational process here. Yeah, love it, Jerry, thank you. And I'm looking at Kevin's um, comment in the chat, that's great. Yeah, just, just change into first person, second person using you, I, we, it really changes things. You know, when, when students come across statements that say students in this course will, they, they feel like objects, um, that it's not really speaking to them as an individual coming into that experience. And so just that subtle change is actually quite dramatic. It's subtle in the matter in the fact that it just takes so little effort and just tweaking it. And feel free if others have done that as well um, to change any of your language or if you can see the benefit, great, feel free to share there. And then another thing to do in that early opportunity zone is to really think about how you can connect student to students and connect them with each other. Um, you might use Flipgrid, you might use other tools. Um, I know VoiceThread is another one that's commonly used. It has a bit more of a learning curve and it has an expense to it at a certain level. Um, Flipgrid is something that's absolutely free. And I found that the instructors are more likely to adopt to this, not only because it's free, but it's also extremely easy to use. Um, so I would encourage folks, if you, if you want to look for a way to try and connect with your students early on and, and post a welcome video to them, in a way that they can also respond to and connect with, with each other, this is a great way to do it because you start to get names and faces and identities. And, and we'll talk about other ways to do that in a moment, but absolutely free and, and easy to do. And, and people can add their own personality if they want to with some of the effects that are there. Is anybody else doing anything else to um, strategically try and you know, connect yourself to students or have them connect with each other early on? Feel free to share in the chat. And then again, keep, keep any comments or questions flowing as well. Uh, discussion board, yeah, and you can use it right within Canvas if you wanted to, to do, to do a discussion board. Um, I like adding Flipgrid because sometimes with um, discussions in Canvas, 
if you do too many discussions in that one format, then students, it'll maybe sometimes go downhill. And so if you can mix it up by using a little bit of Flipgrid as to supplement things, then that could be a great strategy as well. And though, yeah, and Kevin says combination, absolutely. You can actually, yeah, you can have flip, add Flipgrid on Canvas. You can embed that. So you can create a, a page in Canvas. And once you have your Flipgrid created, you can take the embed code, copy, paste, boom, into the HTML editor within Canvas. And you'd be good to go within 60, 90 seconds on that. Great, a welcome inter introduction statement. Okay, students can choose whether to type or use a video. Choice is another great option, yeah. And that's one of the things I like about um, VoiceThread is it does give that choice where it could be video, audio, or text. And so that's a reason why you might use something like VoiceThread if you have access to that. Supporting a wide range of learning styles, also accessibility. And that accessibility will come up a couple, couple times today for sure. Great, so keeping that in mind for sure as you're using these different tools. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna keep us going here. And then another way to really get to know your students is to use this learner connectedness survey. And let's see, Michelle Pekansky Brock mentioned a version that she talked about earlier this morning. I think it was just an introduction type of survey, but um, I call it a learner connectedness survey. And you can see the different categories that are there for students to be able to share their name and identity, the, their name, their pronouns, the preferred name. Those are the gateway to their identity. And then they'll share a little bit about their background. Um, on this screenshot and on subsequent screens, you would see that none of them have an asterisk next to, next to them because we don't require students to complete all of the elements. They share what they like to share. And the information only goes to you as the instructor. So this is a simple Google form that we've created. And if you wanted to, you could use the QR code to access that now. And it actually would elicit a copy of the Google form for you. So you would own your own copy that you could modify and edit, and then you would own the data as you choose to use it with your students. It's not something that's gonna be attached to us whatsoever. Um, but as students go through this, they can share things about their logistics, their, um, their situational factors, bandwidth technology, their working hours. Um, you know, are they sharing space with others? Certainly during COVID, there were more factors, more complications around that. Um, they can share things about themselves as a learner. Where do they feel strong as a learner? Where do they feel they may have challenges? What are some of their goals? Um, what are they working toward? So those are some great things that you can have students share along the way. Great, thanks for putting the link in there. Okay, and then as far as the syllabus, how do you get students to take notice and then actually read the syllabus? So let's go ahead and go into a Padlet. I'm gonna grab that real quick here. Paste that in and just to remind folks, when you click on the link that's in chat, it's gonna take you out of Zoom and into your browser. And that's where we're all gonna meet here as I do the same thing along with you. And we'll be able to see some of your answers populate. And I know with about uh, 10 to 12 of you, we could also do this via chat. The thing I like about Padlet is that these will actually all stay here for you and you could access them afterwards. And, and when I use Padlet, sometimes I'll use them for multiple responses. So right now I'm just asking people for, um, you know, column one and column two. Uh, let's see, let's, let's go ahead and say 2A and 2-3. Any of those three columns there, if you have anything you wanna share. Yeah, supports the asynchronous folks that might come in after the fact and view it. They wanna go see your responses, but they also wanna contribute after the fact, after the live session, that's great. And I see we have folks in there, make it eye-catching graphics, yeah. And then how can you chunk it up visually? Love that. And then maybe when I get into sharing a couple of examples, maybe you'll have a little bit more to share as examples. If you have links, to any of your syllabi available and you wanna put those links into the Padlet, feel free. Maybe they're behind your LMS or maybe you have them available as a Google Doc. Uh, but as we go to look at some examples, feel free to share more. Okay, let me hit refresh periodically. 
And then I know that some people will encounter restrictions, barriers or resistance when trying to change their syllabus. Too much information can make it less appealing. You still have to find that balance. Yeah, more is not better necessarily. And so you can really use the syllabus to kind of sell what your course is about to students get them excited and engaged about it and have just the critical need to know information to get them launched. And then you can use Canvas to have all the other information that might be the heavier stuff, policies and things like that. You can link to those from within your Canvas course. And maybe your campus even has a Canvas shell that does all of that for all of the instructors, all the common policies and things like that. Liquid or infographic syllabus? Yeah, and liquid syllabus, that's a great Michelle Pekansky Brock term. Uh, if you're using something like Google site to have this available way before the class and outside of the LMS, that's great. We'll talk about the infographic syllabus as well. Awesome. UDL universe examples, great. Um, some of you may know I actually uh, moderate UDL universe, created that back in 2008. I don't moderate that, moderate it that often. It gets neglected, unfortunately. Um, Digital escape room, escape rooms. Yeah, that can be a great sort of newer version of the syllabus quiz. Um, some people use syllabus quizzes still, which I think is great. I've seen um, some instructors abuse it where they'll hide one word and do a quiz and actually grade students on whether or not they'll find that one word and they'll have it hidden on page 10 deep within some policy that most people don't need to read or necessarily care much about. And so don't trick your students. Try and make it fun and engaging and reward them. Okay, connect it to some of their life success skills or what the outcomes of the course are, absolutely. So bringing in a little bit of authentic assessment or authentic learning if you can, I like that. Love it, thank you. Let's jump back to the slides here. And toggle us back to Zoom and get us going. Okay, so let, let's look at some examples. So some of these have been around for quite a while and I still find that they stand up well. Um, so this is one that I, that I love um, for US history. And this has sort of that digital narrative sort of Ken Burns style. Um, and it's actually in a newsletter format. And I will talk about accessibility. And, and what I always do is I talk to instructors about taking your existing word syllabus, which is the most common format. So take your existing word syllabus, update it, and then copy and paste that into a visual template, which could be in different formats that I'll talk about in a second here. And then the next term, do any updating or tweaking you need to do in the word version. And then you can apply those updates to your visual version. And always keep those two. One can be on a file for the department for accreditation. It can be for accessibility purposes or for students who prefer the text version. The other is gonna be your more visually engaging syllabus that a lot of students will prefer and they'll really sit up and take notice of that. So that's just some guidelines there. Okay, so that's just page one of multiple pages on a syllabus and on a couple slides later from now, I have several examples you can go to and also on the UDL Universe website that was mentioned earlier. There's a lot of them there as well. Uh, let's look at another example here. So this is sort of a before and after. This goes back to 2011. This is not that new, but this is a marketing instructor who realized I'm teaching marketing for goodness sake and this is my syllabus. I need to do something different. So she actually jumped into using an infographic syllabus and students definitely took notice and they all started flocking to her sections of that course. And so it got her department to start having a conversation about doing this because she was able to really market her course and draw students over to that course. Because if you look at the left side, you're gonna think, okay, same old, another course, same format. If you look at the right-hand side, you're thinking, okay, right away, this instructor's thinking and doing things differently. So I'm really curious to see what's gonna happen next. So that's an example there. And I, I need to bring chat back up just to see if anything comes up as we're going along here. And then this is a slide where I just have, I just picked a handful of different ones. And what, what I'll say for, okay, we covered accessibility, always update your Word one, use the template where you don't have to do much more work to do a visual, um, but that, that would be sort of my guidelines. Um, students, 
really like these in general. Faculty, some do, some don't. I've had some faculty who are resistant and they'll say, well, I just don't like this. They'll look at a syllabus like this or the one you saw in the last two slides and they'll say, oh, I just don't like this. And I'll say, well, you know, if I know them well enough, I'll say, well, you know, it's really not about you. It's about your students. The syllabus is for them. So you have to really think about that mindset of, again, it's about the students, it's about their experience. So how, we, how do we take that into consideration as we create these types of resources? Yeah, and so with your images is alt text, absolutely. And we have alt text guidelines that we use and a, and a resource that we use for our faculty and work with them to use alt text effectively. So thank you, absolutely. Okay. So now, how might you do that? Here's some cautions. We already talked about some of these. Yeah, you always wanna keep in the loop as far as accessibility and then also what your department requires. You don't wanna break any protocol there. If you just update your Word version, you're covered. If you use your campus um, template that might be required, you're covered, but then do your own thing above and beyond that with a few extra steps. Accreditation, they're gonna to wanna to often see the standard format, but they will also take notice of a humanized syllabus as well. Okay, and then methods for actually doing it. Um, for those that are creating a more humanized or more visual syllabus, what are you using as a format, as a tool, let's say? Anything besides Word? Google Sites, great. Absolutely, love that. Thank you, Sally and, and Kevin. Free, easy to use. Um, accessible and available outside of the LMS has a lot of advantages. Sway, okay, that's a new one I'll have to look into. Great, and for time purposes, I'm gonna go ahead and go to a couple of the examples that I work on with folks. And the main one late, lately has been Canva. And I love how Canva has hundreds of free templates and how they've also, during the pandemic, have been giving uh, free accounts for .edu email users. Um, it's still the case for K through 12. I'm not sure necessarily for post-secondary, uh, but regardless, there are hundreds of free templates that you can use with Canva. Uh, PictoChart has kind of fallen into the background. That was, that's been around, I think, a little bit longer, but I think Canva is kind of the lead format as far as creating a more infographic type format. Um, or the one that you saw a few moments ago, this is actually a, a Word template. A lot of people don't know if you go to file new under Word, you can open up all these different templates and one of them is newsletter. And this is an example of using the newsletter template. Great, and yeah, as you're doing this, think about disciplines related, or excuse me, images related to your discipline, but also think about diversity of representation in your images because you want students to see themselves going through the discipline, going toward the profession. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you. Keep those comments coming. All right. And I love the course description here. Again, this is a more narrative type description where the instructor, again, is using the, the you will. Um, it's about the journey. Here's how you're going to do critical analysis. Here's how it applies and what it will lead to for you. And yes, it also fulfills this requirement. So I really love that. And you can see how there are actually six pages to the syllabus, I believe. Okay, and then how many of you think about your course description? Do you copy and paste what's in the catalog? Because I'm finding that that's what some people do. And as I look at, a, at the title of something like this course, this should be pretty juicy stuff. This should be like Game of Thrones type stuff. But look what students are presented with. Evolution is the conceptual foundation for all the life sciences. Overview of the theoretical and empirical evolutionary biology using examples that involve sex and or death designed for non-majors. It's this catalog description that's basically just there to tell you the difference between Bio 103 and Bio 104. That's it. It doesn't tell the students anything about the course. It doesn't get them jazzed about what they're going to be doing, what they're going to be learning. We're instead look at something like the science of play. I love this. I would love to take that type of course. I'd love to take the first one too, if it was better advertised. 
So just kind of think about how you might be able to re represent your course and kind of juice it up more and tell students about what they're going to be doing, what they're going to be learning, not just that it fulfills a requirement. Yeah, you can, you can, you can still include the official, but you can expand upon that. You can call it course description, then you could have course journey, or maybe you want to have something else that you spin off of. So definitely work within your rules and parameters, but go outside that box too. Right. You and, have freedom. And and Brett, right. just to, yep. you know, always kind of keep in mind kind of all these tactics all flow into an important strategy to tell the student that you believe that their effort and their engagement in the course is critical for their success, right? It's not all about you. As Brett said, it's not about you as the faculty member. It's about recognizing, and, and often many of our students need the validation that they are here because they have the skills and competency, they have the interests, they have the ambitions to learn things that can really help them proceed in their degree and consequent their employability and whatever else they want to do with their lives, right? And, and if, if you don't make it engaging and, and you then have your students kind of sitting in your class and not responding to questions or not engaging in activities, think back to how did you invite them into this environment? How did you welcome? And, and, and if you set up that right from the get-go of not engaging them and saying they are important, then you, know, you can't blame the students for not being the student you wish you had throughout the semester. So, so that's just, yeah. you know, again, um, uh, habits both within the institutions and within our colleagues and our departments are things that are really challenging um, to change, but they are, as Brett's going through here, they're simple things that don't take a lot of effort and can be a real gift for students to, to, to um, enter into your class with positive and engaging and a motivating attitude. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. And it reminded me of another thing that I hear sometimes from instructors, it, it, you know, I've heard, been hearing this for years is, you know, students today just don't have much of an attention span. And I kind of, you know, pause, listen to them. But if I know them well enough, I just kind of flip it back to them and say, well, does your course have much of an engagement span? <laughs> you know, it, you have to really think about, okay, why might they be disengaged? Um, why might they, they not feel connected to your course? Um, so yeah, there's that sense of welcoming belonging that we talked about at the beginning. Um, but also that engagement factor. So pulling them in. Okay. Um, any other examples of creating interest or getting students to read the syllabus? We've covered a fair amount and I know you've already contributed some things there. Is there anything that we missed that you all are doing? I know quiz, scavenger hunt or escape room type activity. Those tend to be key ones. And then the format, ah, using Pipothesis to do some collaborative reading and annotating and things like that. Love it. Awesome. Yeah, and so with Google Sites, that would work really well for sure. Love that. And you might, you might drop in the link for Hypothesis for those that aren't aware of what that is. Ah, what is an escape room? Oh, Sally, yeah, okay. So an escape room, yep, that's something I haven't done in first person, but I know my, I know family members and friends who love it. And if anyone else wants to explain it, please feel free. Jerry, have you done an escape room? <laughs> uh, just out of the chancellor's office. You know, that's no. about all I did there. I got to get out of the job. No. <laughs> no, no. It, and it's something that's you know popular in, in big cities and other cities in particular, but uh, an escape room is where you go in and usually with a group of friends, but it could be with strangers that you put together with, but you go in and in that room, you're given a set of instructions and then you're given a challenge, series of challenges and you have to solve these different challenges to eventually get out of the escape room. And you're, you're supposed to do it amongst yourselves, but you can ask for help if you need to. There's certain lifelines you can get. 
Um, and some people are actually doing this within Zoom breakout rooms. They'll do escape rooms and Zoom breakout rooms and they'll have somebody hosting an escape room experience in a, in a breakout room. So yeah, if you wanna look up Sally, um, Zoom escape room, and some conferences are using them as well as sort of a uh, community builder type experience. If anybody has an experience doing that, um, feel free to share. But my experience is limited. And I know we've got five minutes, so I'll probably jump us forward a little bit. That's backwards. <laughs> Sorry about my mouse. So creating some community and learner agency. Let's look at some other ideas here. And so we really try and incorporate as many active learning um, things that you can do within your course. And this is something when the pandemic first happened in March of 2020, this is where this was a crowdsourced resource that came up through the Professional Organizational Development Network, the POD Network. And it started at Louisiana State University and then a bunch of other faculty developers and instructional developers jumped in and crowdsourced this document and we just took that and created um, additional activities and then just polished it up into a resource that we offer as a Creative Commons licensed resource. Um, the other one still exists out there, but this is one we keep as a running resource for people because if you can have more techniques to effectively engage students, they're gonna get involved in the learning, they're gonna become agents of their learning, they're going to become more connected to one another. This is all about connecting student to student experiences and them um, having ownership over their learning, having it be more of the process and not having a 50 minute lecture and then something that they do in isolation, but maybe doing a 10 minute section of covering content and then breaking them up into different types of activities. And this resource, you'll actually find that you can um, look at each of these activities and see how it's applied for fully online, for blended high flex, or for traditional on ground courses and how that applies in different ways. Um, so there's a pretty big list here and I'm sure some of you have done some of these, we won't cover them individually given time purposes, but I wanted to at least put that out, out there for you. And the authentic assessment. Are any of you ensuring that your students get authentic assessment experiences? And if you're not sure what that means, just in case, that means you're trying to get students into experiences where they feel like they're actually doing work of the discipline, doing work of the field. So one example might be that they're actually examining case studies. They're trying to solve things or they're doing analyses of a case study. They're trying to diagnose something or come up with a solution for something. They're not just trying to prepare for a test. They're actually trying to work through something, troubleshoot and create solutions or um, some sort of analysis. So yeah, feel free to share if you're doing anything related to authentic learning in there because that is something that again, gives students more agency and there's research that shows for underrepresented minority students, it's particularly critical because again, it gets them through imposter syndrome and it gets them feeling confident about doing the work of the discipline that they belong and they will succeed. So this has multiple benefits. And if I can add on the authentic assessment yeah. activities is if you open the pedagogy in a sense and en enable the students to say, how do I wanna demonstrate my skills and knowledge? Often they will bring up examples of how they are applying the discipline to areas that they are very familiar with. And you can see mm -hmm. research has shown the performance when, when you give a students topics that they are familiar with, their performance improves significantly. And so by allowing them to uh, help identify what would be authentic to them, it can really help you create that inclusive learning experience and they can then demonstrate their skills and knowledge more effectively. Love it. Thanks, Jerry. And, and thanks, Kevin, for, your, for sharing the uh, quiz versus invoice example. Love it. Great. E-portfolios. Yeah, e-portfolios prop these up really well. Okay, so setting the stage for inclusivity, having an inclusivity statement. Um, some people just use their university's diversity statement, which is very 
mission level, very top level, it doesn't speak from who you are. So if you can adopt something like this type of statement, you know, make it about how you feel. Don't just copy something like this, but something like this could be good. Um, when I did many years of universal design for learning faculty development, we had a universal design for learning statement that talked about how they had taken training in universal, universal design for learning and how that supported equity and inclusion. So I would say, you know, use this as a base example if you're not already doing, doing some sort of inclusivity statement so that students know this is important to you individually as an instructor and how you relate with them. It's not just a mission checkoff statement. So, all right. And if you want to create a land acknowledgement, we've actually created this resource to lead you through how to do that. If that's something you feel connected to, I have ancestors who were pushed onto a reservation in Oklahoma. I feel absolutely connected to this. So it's something that I offer in different settings. Um, so we have a quick two page guide on how to create that for yourself. And it's, it's there and avail available for you. <laughs> Um, Jerry, I think we're out of time. And so I think what we're going to do is probably bypass this. This is an image that's been used in the past for equality versus equity versus inclusion. And this is how we've taken into the online learning environment. So that's in the deck for you. We'll just kind of leave that as a teaser maybe and how we use that for humanizing, but also making sure that you're inclusive along the way. And then call to actions for next step. If anybody wanted to, maybe we'll just keep it in the chat for time purposes. So let me back out of Padlet. We won't even put that into the chat, but anybody have something for, to for today, an idea that was sparked for you as a next step based on what you saw in the slides, what was shared from a colleague, was it a Padlet or was it in the chat or a resource that you saw? What can be that next step to further humanize your course? Great. Review and refresh the syllabus. Great. Again, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, there's always ways to tinker with that. And it can be fun. If you make it enjoyable for your students, it kind of makes it more enjoyable for you. You get to get you get to be creative rather than just creating this contract document. Okay, so you have a lot of takeaway resources for you throughout the deck, so feel free. I know that's being posted, and thanks for Kevin for posting many of those along the way. And again, those are Creative Commons licenses. We just ask that as you adapt or adopt, please share or like, give attribution, and share with others. And then hopefully we made this a humanizing experience for you along the way. And then feel free if you wanna be in touch about any of this information, we'd be happy to interact with you beyond the session. So we'll just leave that up there for a moment and then Kevin will take things away. Yeah, I won't take away the slide though. I'll just take away the, <laughs> uh, the last thoughts, which are first, thank you both for sharing these wonderful ideas. Um, I've definitely gotten some and as soon as the curriculum committee agrees that my, I meet the general education requirements again. I'm going to go change my syllabus up again, like Sally said uh, she might do. Um, we also have not only the ability to contact Jerry and Brett uh, individually via email, but we have that Padlet, um, the, not just the ones that Brett and Jerry created for this session, but we have one that the Peralta group created for every session of the conference. And so um, we can use that as another space to stay connected asynchronously for, for those people who are watching the recording. We encourage you to do both. Uh, if you have questions for Brett and Jerry, definitely pop them in the one from the conference, and then we'll uh, make sure they know about them because they may not be watching them every day. We, but they are used widely. Uh, we had people participating in the Padlets up to six months after the recordings were posted last year. So uh, it's nice to see that people are interested in equity all year round. So <laughs> to summarize, you guys are awesome. 
thank you for sharing these equity strategies with us all. Um, we're looking forward to seeing everyone back here tomorrow uh, for the next day of uh, equity conference here. Tomorrow will be focused heavily on discussions. So today was mostly presentations with a lot of interactivity like we saw here, but tomorrow it will lean more heavily in the discussion area and there'll be some great topics. Um, so we look forward to seeing you all again. I'm gonna stop the recording, um, but we don't have to um, say that we're done because <laughs> there's more to do. All right. Thanks, Kevin. And again, thanks, everybody, for participating and, and contributing as well. Yep. And Th thank you so much. Yeah. Aloha. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.